So we're going to hit into our bacterial diseases. Now, as you learn this, everybody needs to listen. There are three things that I expect you to know about every disease. Okay? I expect you to know the etiology. What the heck does that word mean? It's from chapter 14. The cause of it. Since every disease we're covering in this section is a bacterial disease, the etiology is always going to be a specific bacteria that causes that disease. Some of them are very easy to learn because the name of the disease is in the name of the organism that causes the disease. Uh, Clostridium tetani causes tetanus. Bacillus anthracis causes anthrax. So some of them are really simple because they sound alike. Some of them are a little bit more difficult because the name of the bacteria really has nothing to do with the name of the disease. But that's the first thing you need to know about every disease. The second thing you need to be able to do is understand how you get the disease. Is it from eating something? Do you have to get bit by an animal? Do you inhale the bacteria? How do you get that particular disease? And then the third thing is what I call the hallmark sign or symptom. Okay? I don't expect you to be a doctor. I don't expect you to be able to diagnose somebody with the disease based off of the entire syndrome of how it affects them. Okay? I don't want you to write down on that homework that you turn into me that the symptom of this disease is headache, fatigue, fever. That is real generic and that happens for everything. So the hallmark sign or symptom is kind of that, that one or two things that you can identify that makes that disease stand out from something else. Okay? And I'm going to point all these out to you as we go over it. Now if we talk about anything else really in depth for a particular disease, I do expect you to know that too. For example, if we spend a lot of time talking about a vaccination for that disease, you, you need to know that we can vaccinate for that disease. If we spend a lot of time talking about how that disease is a potential threat that some other country is likely to put that in our water supply and you know, attack us with a bioterrorism threat, if we talk about that for 20 minutes, then you do need to know that too. But other than that, you need to focus on etiology, transmission, hallmark sign or symptom. Okay? So that's not that bad. We're not going over that many. There's only 27 slides, so there can't be more than 26 diseases if I had to just estimate. Okay? So now also, I feel like I have to say, I'm going to give you the gross picture warning. Okay? If you don't want to look at a gross picture, you do not have to. If you don't want to watch a nasty video, you do not have to. But unfortunately, when I show you a gross picture, that's usually the way that it kind of imprints into your mind what the hallmark sign or symptom of that disease would be. So just if you don't like gross stuff, you do not have to look at it. And there's going to be some nasty pictures in here, which is why it's fun. All right. So we're going to follow along with your textbook in that we're going to go through each chapter just pulling out those bacterial diseases. We start in chapter 21, which discusses diseases that affect your skin and eyes. Okay? So before we really get into that, think about, have we talked about the skin before? What have we talked about? That is your first line of defense in the immune system, right? Why was it a good first line of defense? Covers the whole body. Does it have little holes in it to let things in and out? Sorry, that's, I guess that's my ring or something making that light. Um, it has what we call tight junctions, holding everything really tightly together. Doesn't like to let things in or out. Okay? So most of the diseases we talk about that affect the skin are going to be superficial infections, meaning they're really just going to be on the surface. They're not going to, they're going to have a really hard time getting into the body. Now they can but they're going to have a hard time doing that. Your skin is also very dry. Your skin can have places that have oil. Your skin can be salty. So it's overall not really a good environment for anything to live on. And even on top of that, you've got the normal microbiota on your skin. And what do they do? What does your normal microbiota do to keep you from getting sick? 
they leave no space, they leave no nutrients. So overall, your skin is actually pretty healthy. It's hard to get those infections. But all that being said, obviously we're going to talk about some infections. So on this sheet of paper, this particular slide, I listed some of the most common normal microbiota you see on your skin. And you'll see as we start going through these infections, most of the infections of the skin or diseases of the skin are opportunistic infections where your normal microbiota kind of goes somewhere it's not supposed to go. And when you see the names of the normal microbiota, that kind of makes sense right away. We have the diphtheroids. The most common is Propionibacterium acnes. What do you think that bacteria causes? Acne. Okay. That's actually a normal microbiota who doesn't hurt you unless he goes down deep into your pores, starts growing really fast, then he can cause acne, which is very different than a pimple. We're going to talk about that in a minute. There's lots of different cocci that live on your skin. There's Staphylococcus, which is the horrific staph infection that we all think, you know, you rub on somebody dirty and you get a staph infection, which is not true. That's not where they come from. Micrococcus, you can give you a rash. Streptococcus can do several different things to you, including a really nasty disease we're going to look at in a minute. So lots of guys living on you. Now the yeast we're not going to talk about yet. Why? Are yeast bacteria? No. They're eukaryotic cells and we are focusing on the bacterial infections right now. Okay? So let's just jump right on in and let's find a disease of the skin. And the first one we're going to look at is infotigo. Have you guys ever heard of infotigo? Okay. You're usually going to see it in kids. Okay? Now, so let's start thinking about why. This is a disease caused by Staphylococcus, which is a normal microbe, normally on your skin. So we all have Staphylococcus on us right now, but we all don't have a nice, yellow, itchy, crusty sore. They call them honey colored, but I just think that sounds kind of gross, so I like to go with yellow. But why do, you know, we all have this bacteria. Why don't we all have that real pretty sore on our mouth right now? Well, our immune system is keeping this bacteria under control. Do children have as developed of immune systems as we do? No. They hadn't been working on their immune system for 30 years like some of us have, or 20 years, depending on how old you are. They're more likely for that staph to start causing that infection on their face. It's because they put everything in their mouth. It can get anywhere, but it's mainly, mainly around the oral mucosa, and that's because kids put stuff in their mouth, and it's, it's highly <laughs> contagious because kids not only like to touch their mouth, they like to touch each other, they like to touch everything. Why are you, why are you making that face at me, Kay? You've got to tell me a story. Yeah, it can get everywhere, but it probably started, if I had to guess. <laughs> He looked like a leper. I like it. We're going to talk about that. Let's see before today is over with. Um, so how do you think that it's very treatable. It's bacterial. They can give antibiotics. Um, if it got everywhere on some kids, you know, that makes me think that they either didn't take him to the doctor when they should have to get antibiotics or what they gave him, that particular staff was just a little resistant to it and it just took them a while to get it under control. But it's very, very curable. Most kids get it at some point in their life. Um, so when I look at that picture, that immediately makes me think that that kind of looks like a fever blister. Any of the rest of you kind of see the resemblance? Have you ever gotten one or seen a fever blister on somebody's mouth? All right. Well, that itches. And if you've ever had a fever blister, you know fever blisters don't itch. They hurt. You're not going to sit there and pick at a fever blister. It, it doesn't feel good. When little kids have impetigo, they scratch. And boy, that makes it even worse. Because as they start scratching, they're pushing that staff further in, moving it around, spreading that impetigo. And, you know, a little kid, if they're going to scratch their mouth because it's itching, and if their booty starts itching a minute later, they're going to reach back there and scratch it too. And then, hey, impetigo just travels around the body. So, not a lot of fun. And these pictures are all much better when you look at them on the actual computer screen. It kind of loses something in the projection. So you all, 
If you're weird like me, take time to look at the pictures on the computer. They look better. Okay? All right, so we started with something pretty simplistic, not real pretty, just itchy. Well, let's take it a step further. Whenever we were in chapter 14, we talked about local infections, systemic infections, focal infections. You guys remember those terms? Okay. Impetigo is a local infection. Wherever that staph went down into the skin, it caused that sore. In some very, very young children with even weaker immune systems, they can get systemic impetigo. So it starts as, you know, kind of that little sore, but then it gets into the bloodstream. Once you get systemic impetigo, we call that scald skin syndrome. Okay, and the reason it's called scald skin syndrome is because it kind of looks like the kids have been almost dipped in boiling water and their skin is scalded because it's the very outside squamous epithelium, outside layer of their skin, is flaking off. And it, if you've ever been sunburned real bad where you peeled and you could grab that little thin layer of skin and peel it off, that's kind of what it looks like. But it's only found in really, really young children. A lot of times, this happens before they even get to leave the hospital. And so they end up having to stay in the hospital a few more days until it can be cured up, you know, treated with antibiotics. And then they're going to be perfectly fine. It's not going to leave horrific scars because it's just the very outside layer of your skin. And that can come back. Now, people always ask me when I put this up and start showing these pictures, does it hurt? I mean, I don't know. It, I'm, I've never had it that I know of. And all the children that have it are so young, you can't ask them. But they never look real happy in a picture. And their skin's real bright red, probably real sensitive to touch. So I'm sure it's not a whole lot of fun. Okay. So the way I'm going with this, we started with a little itchy sore on the mouth, right? Then it got in the bloodstream, flaking off the outside layers of the skin. Well, we can stay with Staphylococcus, that same generic um, normal microbiota, and it can get really bad. This is what happens when Staph, or also Strep, that is your normal microbiota, becomes antibiotic resistant or extremely virulent, which just means it has mutated in some way that it is growing like crazy. This is called necrotizing fasciitis, or what you would call it, flesh-eating bacteria. Okay? Flesh-eating bacteria does not mean you've done something you weren't supposed to do, you were in a bad place, and you got a bacteria on you, and he is just sitting there eating your flesh. That's not really what it means. You were just unlucky and you ended up with an infection of an antibiotic resistant or virulent strain of staph or strep. Okay. If you do get this, it usually starts with a very small wound, and in as little as six to eight hours, it can destroy a fairly large portion of your body. Okay. So if they find something like this, so both of these pictures, you notice how smooth the edge is. I know y'all may not want to look at it for real long, but if you notice how smooth the edge is, okay, this woman's got a tube in her mouth. These people are in the hospital. They've already had it cleaned. What they do is they have to go in and physically remove tissue. That's why it's got such a nice, pretty little edge to it. They cut all that tissue out because there's no way to really kill that bacteria. They, these people came into the hospital with a really big, nasty-looking sore. They did some tests. Usually, they'll draw a line around it with a Sharpie. They run tests, and if they come back and it's already spread past the Sharpie, before they can figure out what's going on, they just start removing. They remove a big chunk of tissue, then keep running tests, try to get all of the bacteria out. If this keeps spreading on this guy's foot and his ankle, what do you think they're going to do to him? They're going to cut his leg off to try to keep that bacteria from spreading any further. So what you think is going to happen to this poor lady over here? She's in a lot of trouble, right? That's just luck of the draw. 
she got it on her face, you can't cut that off if you can't get rid of it. So that's much more likely going to be a fatal infection than the one on the foot. There is an extremely famous model, and I cannot think of her name now, and I haven't been able to for the past few years. I really need to look it back up. But about seven years ago, she was a European model. She was a big international model, so much to the point that she had insured parts of her body. And I don't know if you guys know you can do this or not, but if you're famous for a particular part of your body, some of these women will have it insured so that if something ever happens to that part of their body because that's how they make their living, they would actually still be able to live or survive. Or, you know, I don't know all the details of that. Of course, I've never looked into insuring my leg because I thought it was so nice. But, um, so this lady was a model. And, she, and the reason this story got so popular is she had actually insured her legs. She was real tall, I guess real famous for her long legs. Well, one night, she shaved her legs before she went to bed. Like, you know, how many of us do that, right? Just how many of you get a brand new razor every time you shave your legs? No, nah, I don't. I don't know about y'all, but they're expensive, right? So you use it until you've used it and then you realize, oh, I still kind of prickly after I shaved, right? That means it's time for a new razor. That's how you know, okay? So she picked her razor up out of the shower, shaved her legs, you know, nicked herself a little bit while she was shaving. I mean, we've all done that before, right? You get around the knee, oops, cut it a little bit, bled just for a second, it's fine. Went to sleep. Woke up the next morning. Half of her leg was just disgusting because the bacteria had grown overnight. And so she, the reason the story was so popular in the news seven, eight years ago, she filed it on her insurance because she had insured her legs and that was something she couldn't control. But what they ended up figuring out, they tested the shower and just by chance that bacteria was in that hotel shower. And so when she laid her razor down on the shower ledge and then nicked herself shaving, she got a flesh eating bacteria just simply by chance. I could guarantee you if we went to Forest General right now, we go right up the road, they'll have at least one case of antibiotic resistant staph somewhere in that hospital right now. They always do. They may not have somebody with half of their face gone. It may be somebody that just had a really nasty looking boil, staph infection. Yeah, any, not any animal can get it, but other animals can get bad staph infections. It's very common, but it doesn't always go to this extent. But I'm going to show you the shocking picture if I'm going to show you one. Go ahead, Colton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's real common. In, it's real common in bed sores, and that comes from it's hard to kill that bacteria, and so they just keep spreading it around the nursing home. And nursing home, it gets it doesn't get spread around hospitals quite as much as much because they're a little bit more serious about keeping things clean the way they're supposed to. And I mean, I'm not down in the nursing home, but it's just harder for them to take care of everything. They don't have quite as trained of workers in a nursing home as you would necessarily have in a hospital. So it's, it's spread really quickly there. Okay. So the point of that, I'm going to change the picture because some of y'all are giving me a horrible face, but the point I wanted you to see with those three diseases is just that same bacteria that we all have on us right now can be as simple as a pimple. I mean, you've all had a staph infection. If you just got that one weird random pimple all of a sudden, you pop it and it goes away, a lot of times that actually was a staph infection. Okay? It can, if you get a sty in your eye, that's a staph infection in the follicle of your eyelash. Those are staph infections. So it can be something real minor that every one of us has have had before, or it can be impetigo. That's ugly. It itches, but it goes away. Scald skin syndrome. Now it's in the bloodstream. It's making the outside layers of the skin fall off all the way to now that one particular staph mutated and it's eating half of the flesh of your leg away. And all that is caused by the same bacteria. So just to me, it's kind of impressive that the same bacteria can do that wide range of things. 
all based off of that one bacteria can be a little different than his cousin. Just like we are all human beings, you know, a lot of us in this room are all women, female humans, but we're all very different from each other. Every Staphylococcus aureus is a little different from the other. Okay. Go ahead, Pepper. A boil is just a, a boil is a mad pimple. It's a staph infection. It's the same thing. A pimple can turn into a boil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be, it can be a spider bite. It can be a pimple you pinched on and squeezed on too much. It can be a place where you cut your skin, nick yourself shaving. Anything that opens that skin and pushes that staph from the outside in can cause that. Hey, Colton. You talking about on the scald skin syndrome picture? Well, that's his skin flaking off. Is that what you're talking about? That's his skin flaking off. Yeah, it just doesn't look as good in the projection. But if you look at the real picture, this is a layer of skin that is peeling off, and that's just showing you where it's it's cracking off. Well, and they probably would put something. This, I mean, these are both white babies, but they're really, really white, so there's, they probably do have something on them just to keep it from irritating them. I mean, if you've ever been, like I've had that bad of a sunburn before where it's peeling, and then you sit there and you start peeling it just because you can't stand it, and then you peel it a little further than you should have, and it hurt like heck, right? That baby's whole skin, their whole body is hurting like that, I would assume. So, just not fun. Okay? All right. So, that's just some... Is that all the diseases you could get on the skin from staph? No, of course not. I just wanted to show you the progression from pimple to, oh crap, half the face is gone, right? So just kind of a wide range. So now let's take a look at some infections of the ear. And this is caused by our friend Pseudomonas. You guys seen Pseudomonas before? Any of you that ever grabbed the little bluish green test tube in lab because he was kind of cool looking? That's Pseudomonas aeruginosa. If you poured that test tube into your ear, you would get swimmer's ear. Okay? Swimmer's ear doesn't necessarily have anything to do with swimming. Swimmer's ear is the common name for Otis externa, ear infection. That's all it is. Okay? An ear infection is caused by a bacteria growing somewhere in your ear. It can grow in several different places deep down within your ear. But if you get a bacterial infection in your ear, it's just called swimmer's ear. Again, this is something easily treated by antibiotics. So what's neat about it? Well, we all know what ear infections feel like. Probably all had one. You know, it hurts. You run a fever sometimes. You may have been a baby when you had one, but not that big of a deal. Here's what I think is kind of neat about these infections to talk about. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is not killed by chlorine. It loves nice warm temperatures. So guess where he is, his favorite place to hang out is? Swimming pools and hot tubs. He grows even better in a hot tub than he does in a swimming pool. He can also live in a sauna. He can live in the steam in the air. So you don't even have to go swimming. You can go sit in a sauna and he can get into your ear from the steam, sitting in a steam room, and you can get an ear infection. Just kind of neat to me that he's learned how to live in those environments. Whenever babies get ear infections, they run real high temperatures. That's just because they're young and that's their body's really only defense against it. You can get an ear infection and not run quite as high of a fever. Your immune system's a little bit more mature. Okay. All right. Infections of the eye. So you guys have all heard of pink eye before, right? Okay. What causes pink eye? Come on, tell me, what do you think? What causes pink eye? It's fecal. 99% of pink eye is caused from fecal bacteria being placed into the eye. Pink eye is a generic term for any infection in your eye. Okay? Now, we've already learned a few things about the bacteria in your eye, right? 
Do you all have bacteria in your eye? You do. You all have normal microbiota in your eye. So it can't be a staph in your eye. You all got those. It can't be a micrococcus in your eye. You all have that. You get pink eye or eye infection or conjunctivitis. It all means the same thing. From getting a bacteria that's not normally in your eye, in your eye. Where it usually comes from, kids often get pink eye more than we do. So they scratch their little honey, rub it in their eye. There you go. Poo poo in the eye equals pink eye. Nasty. You know you have pink eye when what happens? <laughs> It'll turn red around the edges and you go to wake up and you open your eyes but nothing happens. Right, they're kind of crusted together. I actually have never had pink eye, so I'm just going off of what you guys have told me in the past, and I hope I never get it. Just because you wake up and you have some extra sleepy in your eye, does that mean you have pink eye? No, and I wish somebody would teach the daycare, because if those kids wake up and they got a little crusty around their eye, they immediately call on you, and your kid's like in quarantine, sitting in the front like they're in trouble. You know, oh, they got pink eye. Pink eye, you're going to have ex a whole bunch of stuff running out of the eye. When you go to open it, it is going to be pretty much sealed shut. You're going to have to force it open when you wake up. Why is it doing that? It's trying to get it out. That is a mucus being made by the mucus membranes of your eye trying to flush that stuff out of there that's not supposed to be in there. Why do contacts often lead to more eye infections and pink eye? Because you got to touch them to put them in there. So how many of you wear contacts? I do, so I make fun of myself. Okay. So before you put your contacts in every morning, do you take soap and do you sing the hand washing songs and wash your hands and then put your contact in? I don't because I just got out of the shower. I'm clean. All right? I'm not going to wash my hands. I don't. I'm going to be honest. Now, if I've been like doing something else and I'm going to put my contacts in, I wash my hands. But have I touched things with bacteria on them since I got out of the shower? Sure, I have. I grabbed that towel. I wiped off. Right? I just comb. I don't dry, but I comb my hair out. All I guess I put my deodorant on, brush my teeth. Right? You know, you got your routine. You go through, and then you pop those contacts in. Also, a lot of people that wear contacts do not take them out like they're supposed to. You're not supposed to sleep in them. Now I know some of them are designed now where you can, but you're still really not supposed to sleep in those contacts. And that's because it traps things in there that aren't supposed to be in your eye and then you wear it all night long. It's more likely to cause an infection. But my husband never takes his contacts out and he's actually never had pink eye either. So I guess some people's eyes are just a little bit more resistant than others. Now most of us know what pink eye is, right? And it's probably not fun. But let me tell you, there are eye infections that make pink eye seem wonderful. And anybody would just beg, please, I will take the pink eye. Take this other stuff away. Okay. I can't talk about all of them, but I chose to talk about two of them. One is ophthalmia neonatorum caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay. So what do you think that is? That's gonorrhea in your eye. Most often it's seen in babies. Well, what happened for that baby to get gonorrhea in their eye? Their mama had gonorrhea. And as the baby was coming into the world, that baby got a wonderful present from their mom on the way out. And they got gonorrhea in their eye. It used to be a much bigger problem, but nowadays we actually treat every newborn that's born, we put antibiotics in their eyes. Because so many babies were getting permanent issues with their eyes because they were getting gonorrhea from their mother. Okay? And we can't force a woman to have an STD test. It, you have to agree to that. So we can't force that and a lot of babies were getting it on the way out. Okay? Mm -hmm. The parents refused for their child to get the antibiotics in their eyes. Shoot, once that kid was out, I didn't care what they did to it. Like, just clean it up and then you can give it back to me. I don't really care. Just do what you want to do, but it looks nasty right now. So take it over there, clean it, and then you can bring it back to me. I wasn't one of those moms that wanted it gross. I just didn't. I wanted it clean before you gave it to me. Um, but yeah, like you could watch, and it's, they put a cream, they put drops, they do all kind of crazy stuff to that baby. They, you know, suck all that stuff out of their mouth and their nose and 
Uh, that surprises me. No, it doesn't. It doesn't surprise me that parents refuse that because some parents refuse. It sounds like my sister it wants to be so natural that, like, you know, yeah. Yeah, if y'all want to watch, I shouldn't say this on recording myself, but y'all want to see some weird videos? There are women now that have their baby at home in their own bathtub and just catch it. I it, I just don't understand that. So, yeah, after they gave their dog a bath in the bathtub, that's pretty funny. But anyway, you know, to each their own. Maybe they want that wonderful moment with their baby. It's just not for me. I want to be in a hospital that's clean. You know, yeah. I, I, I want I want the I want all the luxuries of living in 2013. I do. All right. So my last eye infection is not something that you ever have to worry about getting here in the United States. So why even talk about it if we don't need to worry about it? Because we love to give help to other countries, right? But this is not something we help other countries with. And this is, in my opinion, the things that, as an educated nation, we should be helping with instead of some of the other things that we do. This disease is the number one cause of blindness all over the world. And it's a very simple bacterial infection in the eye that can be treated with antibiotics. It is spread by contaminated water. So all you need to prevent it is chlorine in the water. So we could prevent most of the cases of blindness in the world by simply helping people get clean water and antibiotics for the eyes for the people that already have it. And then we could completely get rid of this disease. Okay? It's called, I always say it funny, chlamydia trachomatis. Got it right. Chlamydia trachomatis. It causes trachoma of the eye. What trachoma of the eye does, you get the bacterial infection in the eye, and it slowly destroys the connective tissue behind the eyelid. So the eyelids begin to turn inside out. As it turns inside out, the eyelashes rub on the cornea, destroying vision, extremely painful. These people have to flip their eyelids back out where they can get to it and pluck their eyelashes out to keep it from being so painful. I don't know about y'all, but if you've ever accidentally pulled on an eyelash too hard, like you just start tearing up because it's so painful, these people would rather pull their eyelashes out than feel the pain of the eyelash constantly rubbing. As it keeps degrading, it completely destroys the vision, and the eyelids turn inside out permanently. That picture right there is what it looks like when someone has trachoma. That's not one of those weird, gross kids. You know those kids when we were little that could flip their eyelids inside out and like gross you out? That's not somebody doing that. They have no ability to fix their eye. That person is blind. And once it causes damage to the eye, there is no fixing it. They flip in. Eventually, it's not flipped in anymore, but the inside of the eye is so droopy and lost all of its elasticity, it starts hanging down below where the eyelashes are. So it's, it's kind of at first they flip in, and then they get so droopy they just completely hang down. No, I had a, I had a pug. Mm -hmm. When I had a pug named Duchess, it was my ba my baby. I'm gonna get teary because I don't have her anymore. But I had a pug named Duchess, and when she was a little bitty puppy, I picked her because she was the cutest pug ever. When we went to get her, she was like super bug eyed. You could see the white all the way around her eyes, and I thought that was the cutest thing ever. She just always looked real attentive. And we noticed that uh, we noticed that when she would sleep, her eyes didn't close all the way. But I didn't think anything of it. And then one day, the vet started telling me she was losing her vision because her eyelids couldn't close all the way. So they had to take her eyeballs out deep in her eye sockets and then put them back in and sew her little eyelids shut a little bit so that she could see better. So I mean, I've, I've paid for eye surgery on a dog before, so I can feel you there. Um, but that's not this. This is a bacterial infection that causes this. And I have, at the end of this class, I'm going to show you guys some videos. I don't do it in the middle because it 
it kind of gets you off track of what you got to learn. But one of the videos I'm going to show you shows you this village, and they know that by the time they're 25, 30 years old, they will be blind. And when you watch this video, you will see the little children, their job in the village is to help the people older than them walk around. They help the older people pluck their eyelashes out. And they know that one day that's going to be them because it's in the water supply and they do not have the technology or the ability to clean their water. Think about how horrific of a life that would be to know. Say that again. Boiling water will not kill it. Well, they don't have a filtering system. They need, they need a water system. All they have is a well dug in the ground, and they pull water out of the well. And believe it or not, guys, that's still really common. A lot of us live here, and we think that everybody, I mean, we live in Mississippi. Right? I mean, surely everybody is as technologically advanced as we are. You'd be really surprised if you went to some other countries. All you got to do is walk across the border and go down to Mexico and some of those places, and it's amazing how they get their water and things like that. Go ahead, Colton. Exactly. It just go in and, and a lot of church groups do that, and that's a great thing that they do. They'll go and finance building a well and trying to get fresh water, but if they don't spend a lot more money to do actual filtration, ultraviolet system to clean the water, and I mean you gave them water, but you all, they're, all, they're still going to get disease from the water. Probably less disease than they would get from the river where they're taking a bath and using the bathroom in, but it's still going to be. There, there are some programs trying to get clean, fresh water. This is not the only disease. I just spend a lot of time on this one, but this is not the only disease you can get from water. And there are a lot of programs trying to get water to lots of people that don't have it, but it doesn't get funded very often. Okay? We would rather fund other things that, you know, and this is not a politics class. I'm not trying to be political. I just, if as a person that understands microbial diseases, I would much rather vaccinate clean water, do those types of things for other people than I would some of the things that we do. All right? That is all we are going to cover out of Chapter 21, just those diseases of the skin. Okay? So see, we're not doing entire chapters. We're just picking some notable diseases out of each chapter. So then we move into Chapter 22 which would be diseases of the nervous system. Now, diseases of the nervous system are a little tricky to talk about because I can't show you a picture that's gross to get your attention. What is your nervous system made of? Nerves, brain, right? All that's your nervous system. Your nervous system is actually the only sterile system in your body. Okay. There's never supposed to be any normal microbiota in your nervous system. If you get bacteria or virus or anything, but we're on bacteria now, in your nervous system, that equals very, very bad news. And it can be something that causes headaches, fever, you know, possibly even some seizures, but then you get better and you may have no long-term effects from it. Or it could be an infection that causes headaches, fever, seizures, and then you are never the same again. Okay? It depends on lots of factors. Intensity of the seizures, does it cause permanent brain damage? Where was the permanent brain damage localized? Because you know, if you take an AMP class, you learn different parts of the brain control different things that happen in your body. So, and you don't have to know all this. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how this is going to work. If I have damage in the front part of my brain, I may be able to run, jump, be a famous athlete like I always have been. It's not going to affect any of my motor functions, but I may talk different. I may have a different personality. That's 
all controlled in the very front of my brain. If I have damage, you know, kind of here in the center portion, then I may not be able to use my legs anymore simply by moving where the damage was. So it's never going to be something I can just say, oh, you had this infection, it's always going to cause this. It's going to be different for different people just depending on the severity and where in the particular part of your nervous system it infects. There are going to be some terms we're going to see over and over again as we go through the diseases of the nervous system, and you've heard these words before. But I don't think you realize probably that the words are quite as generic as they are. You've all heard the word meningitis. Right? Maybe you've heard encephalitis. Okay? You can even put them together and get meningoencephalitis. These words simply mean infection and inflammation of part of your nervous system. Meningitis refers to the meninges. Surrounding your brain and your spinal cord are these three connective tissue layers that just help protect your brain and spinal cord, keep things out, keep things in like they're supposed to. So if you get an infection that's trying to get into your brain or your spinal cord, it's going to infect those meninges. So you get swelling of the meninges, which is meningitis. So you can get meningitis from any bacteria or any virus or any protozoan, any worm, Anything that gets into those meninges is not supposed to be there, and you can get meningitis. Okay? Encephalitis means that the bacteria, the virus, whatever you're talking about, made it into the actual brain itself, and the brain is swelling, and it has an inf active infection. That's encephalitis. Okay? If you've got both of it going on, that's the meningoencephalitis. Okay? how long it stays swollen and infected, the particular micro that got in there, all that's going to affect how severe the permanent damage is, whether it's loss of function of the legs, the arms, you can't hear anymore, you can't see anymore, it changes your personality. Um, we all probably have a different story. I can tell you, I remember this little two-year-old little girl that got, um, it was viral, but she got an encephalitis, and her brain never developed beyond that. She's now probably 20 years old, but she still has the mentality of a two or three year old. And that's just how it happened to affect her. I know another lady that's older than me from my hometown. She got an encephalitis or a meningitis. I don't remember. She's older than me. And it gave her a stutter. Other than that, she's perfectly fine, but she can't talk really clearly anymore. So we're just going to kind of stay generic for a minute. I want you to know and learn the three most common bacteria we see that make it into the meninges. So uh, most of the time, when you hear somebody talking about having bacterial meningitis, most of the time it's going to be one of these three bacteria that have caused the meningitis. But we all understand it doesn't have to be one of these three. It can be anything that gets in there. But these are the three that we see most often. A couple scary things about bacterial meningitis. The signs and symptoms of bacterial meningitis for the first four to five days are almost identical to a really bad cold or the flu. Headache, fever, fatigue. I don't know about y'all, but if I have fever and a headache and I just don't feel good, I'm not immediately going to go to the doctor and say, I think I have meningitis, test me. Okay? After about day five, that's when it starts to get kind of separate itself a little bit. And one of the most characteristic things we see with meningitis and not the flu is stiffness of the neck. So people will report pain in their neck. It's real stiff. They have a hard time turning their head just right. But then a lot of people would say, well, I probably slept funny, right? I got a crick in my neck. So it's one of those things that it just its kind of luck of the draw. If you really go to the doctor and they figure out that's what's wrong with you, until you've had it for long enough that it might cause some severe damage. Another scary thing about meningitis, it is spread by droplet transmission. Y'all remember what droplet transmission was? Sneezing or coughing in someone else's face. So you may look at me and think that I have a sinus infection or even scarier. There may be nothing wrong with me and I could be carrying these bacteria 
then I sneeze or cough on you, and your immune system lets one of these guys into your nervous system. Then you get meningitis, and I'm never going to get meningitis from it. Okay. So we're going to kind of go separately through them. And the first one is Haemophilus influenza. Most of the time when children get bacterial meningitis, they have Haemophilus influenza. This is a normal microbiota of the respiratory system. So as we all sit here and breathe, and I talk, we are all just spreading Haemophilus, Haemophilus influenza through the room. But none of us are going to get bacterial meningitis from it. Why? We got that good, strong immune system. He doesn't let it. Our immune system does not let that bacteria in. Little children, much more likely to get it. Neisseria meningitis. That is the most common bacterial meningitis we see spreading through college campuses. This one has all the typical signs and symptoms of bacterial meningitis plus a rash in the throat. So if you've ever seen a news story where a bacterial meningitis outbreak and they named some college dormitory, it was Neisseria meningitis that was being spread. Now all four-year universities that have college housing require that you get this vaccine before you're allowed to live in the college housing because it was such a problem for a while. Okay. And then the last one, Streptococcus pneumoniae. Again, this is something that we all carry in our respiratory tract. But in very, very old people, immunocompromised people, if they inhale too much of it, it goes into their nervous system, they can have permanent damage caused from simply inhaling this bacteria. So this is something that I think is real interesting to talk about. These are all bacteria that we all come in contact with. And then you say, well, gosh, why am I so unlucky that I get bacterial meningitis and the rest of the population doesn't? Sometimes there's, there's no answer to that question. There's no real reason we can say why you got it and someone else didn't. The good thing in all of this since these are the three most common bacteria that cause meningitis, we have now developed a vaccine against all three of these. But unfortunately, we fall into that mid-group. Most of us are probably not vaccinated against this. If you have children, they're vaccinated. My child, she's received two of the three meningitis vaccines so far. I don't know when they'll give her the third one. When they offer it, I'll sign off on it. These are optional vaccines, though. When you have a child and you take them to the doctor, they bring you in a piece of paper where you have to sign to give permission to, for them to vaccinate your child. Half of the page will be the required ones by law. You need to vaccinate your child against these. And then they'll have optional. And they ask you, do you want your child to get the optional vaccines or not? Of course, I always say, yeah, go for it. Whatever you want to give her, vaccinate her. A lot of parents will say, oh, if she doesn't need it, you know, I don't know. Maybe I should just not do it since it's not required. Well, that, that's the one in the hepatitis B, which has viral. We'll talk about it a little later. But that is the vaccine they give your baby the day they're born or the next day. That's the one they start. So it's the day you're born, yeah. So that's one of the few vaccines they give before the three-month mark. And so I'm sure a lot of parents do refuse that just because, it's a new baby. I didn't. I figure, right? She'll forget it. I'd rather her get vaccinated when she's too little to remember it than have to hold her down and do it, you know. Go for it. So not saying you guys should all rush out and get vaccinated against this. It's much more important that your children get vaccinated against it. When you get older one day, you may want to consider some of these vaccines. I probably will. Okay. They probably wouldn't give them to us yet. We're probably not quite old enough. All right. So staying in the nervous system, how many of you know what listeriosis is? That's what I thought, right? Very few people ever raise their hand, all right? You all should know what it is. Listeriosis is a pretty common bacterial infection. It can be really nasty. It can cause permanent brain damage if you get this infection. But most of the time, it's only very young children very old people that get listeriosis. Are you seeing a trend with diseases of the nervous system? You usually have to have a weakened immune system to get them. Okay? 
So listeriosis is caused by a bacteria called Listeria monocytogenes. Kind of a long, horrific name, but you will not believe me probably when I tell you where Listeria monocytogenes is always found. Food. Hot dogs. Processed sandwich meat. Canned meat. All of it has Listeria in it. You say, well, why do they put it in there? They don't put it in there. It just gets in there. Is that okay? Yeah, what is the, the FDA, what do they say? Well, it's okay that it's in there because it's easy to kill Listeria. And it is. All you got to do is heat it up and you destroy it. It's pretty easy to kill. But how many of you have ever eaten a cold hot dog out of the refrigerator? Dude, I lived on it when I was a little kid. Would I ever let my kid eat a cold hot dog out of the refrigerator? Oh, my God, no. And will I fight with my mom about it? Heck, yeah. Because it says on the front of the package, fully cooked. So your parents are going to say, it's cooked. They can eat it. But on the back of the package, it says, you must boil this hot dog for so many minutes. The reason it's on there is because that bacteria can give your child listeriosis if you do not heat that hot dog properly before you eat it. Okay? Processed sandwich meat. What does processed sandwich meat mean? So here's the way I could, I could describe it to you. Have you ever seen a square pig? No? How do you think they get that piece of ham to be a perfect square to fit on your little square of bread? They cut, they grind up the pig meat, probably not just meat, if you want to know the truth, probably some other entrails and parts in there too, and then they compress it and pack it into a big block and slice it into perfect little squares. That's how they make sausage, Vienna sausage, lots of listeria, and nobody cooks Vienna sausage. I don't eat those either, but a lot of fishermen would die and truckers would die if they didn't have Vienna sausage to eat because that's something easy to take and eat. My dad lives on them. If he's going to go fishing, which I'm from South Louisiana, if my dad's going to go fishing, he's going to go with an ice chest and some Vienna sausage in a can and some crackers, and he will stay on all day with his ice chest and his Vienna sausage. And not me. I want something else to eat. Now, as an adult, obviously this stuff can't be that bad if they sell it in all those foods, right? Because as an adult, your immune system is most likely to destroy it. But very young children can get this. The most pertinent danger with this infection is it can cross the placenta. So women that are pregnant should never eat a cold hot dog. Pregnant women should never eat a cold cut sandwich. And if you have a good obstetrician, they will tell you. The moment you find out you're pregnant, they will look at you and say, now you know you can't eat this anymore. And it's because of listeriosis. While you're pregnant, if you eat cold hot dogs or processed ham on a, cold ham on a sandwich all the time, you could be giving your child a disease that would cause permanent brain damage, possibly even stillbirth without even knowing it because it would never make you sick. So it is an infection that really needs to be well known, and it's not. You saw how many of you raised your hand when I asked who knows what listeriosis is. I kind of knew what it was, but I didn't know how serious it was until I got pregnant. And when my OB said it to me, I thought, you know, I should probably do a little reading on that since I teach this. And when I got to reading, it was really impressive how easy this is to transmit to a fetus and how devastating the effects can be. So if you know anybody that's pregnant, share a little knowledge with them. Okay? Um, last, I guess it was probably two semesters ago, and I had a pregnant lady in here, and she immediately, I eat at Subway every day. Is it okay? I don't know. I've never been back there to see where their meat comes from. I don't know if their ham and their turkey is processed ham or turkey. It's okay to get a real piece of ham sliced in the deli, that's not processed ham. But you don't need to let that sit in the refrigerator for two weeks and then eat it. Um, I admit that while I was pregnant, I even microwaved my sandwich meat, even though it wasn't processed sandwich meat. Just to make sure, I never would have eaten that block of ham that 
in really ham anyway. But I was just kind of over cautious because I had read all that and it just kind of freaked me out a little bit. But um, cold hot dogs, my kid will never eat a cold hot dog, and I'll I'll fight that fight, even though I you know I know I ate them, but I guess I was lucky, or maybe I do have permanent brain damage and I just haven't figured out what it affected yet. But because uh, I lived on cold hot dogs as a kid. This has nothing to do with the lecture, but I have to say this to you guys. Did you see the news report where the old Miss science guy, it was a teacher at Ole Miss, part of his research, he was doing tests to see what was really in the all-white meat chicken nuggets from McDonald's and Burger King? I'll just tell you guys, it wasn't bacteria. That's why I say it has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but um, it, it wasn't meat intestines, all parts of the chicken that you would hope they threw away. <laughs> and then somebody asked me the other day, we were talking about it, and somebody said, but it's white meat. It's bleached to look white. It's not white meat chicken. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the United States. I can say anything I want on TV. Nope. As long as they have some real meat in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of interesting, right? All right, let's stop here. All right, listen. We gotta have time for my videos. We're gonna stop here today.